Hello everyone. In this video, we will discuss the rules for carrying out the drone survey. This is a series video. So those who have missed the first part can watch it and then continue with this video. The government released several sets of instructions called the SOP or the standard operating procedures to allow the operation of UAV drones for carrying out drone survey and submission of the digital aerial images of mining areas to Indian Bureau of Mines. SOP stands for Standard Operating Procedure. A standard operating procedure is a document that contains step-by-step -step instructions and guidelines for the employees to follow when performing a technical repetitive process within an organization. SOPs are employed by a number of organizations to guarantee that tasks are carried out consistently, effectively, and with the least chance of error or omission. Now let us check out the standard operating procedures for carrying out drone survey. There are some guidelines mentioned in the SOP. Let me discuss them one by one. The first guideline is on drone agency registration and permissions. There is no need to register with IBM for drone survey in mines. Drone agencies or the lessee can conduct the survey while following all the applicable rules, regulations and guidelines notified by DGCU. Before flying, check the airspace map from the Digital Sky website. The drone airspace map is an interactive map of India that demarcates the red yellow and green zones across the country. Drones can be operated in yellow and red zones only after a permission from DGC. This is the airspace map of a particular location and here we can see the yellow and red zones. To fly in these zones, you need to take permission from DGC. This is the link for the airspace map. Here you can see the red zone. Here you shouldn't fly the drone without permission. These are the yellow zones. And to fly here, you need to take permission. And here in this zone, you can fly the drone up to 60 meter. Flying above this height, you need to take permission from DGC. The international boundary is denoted by the red color. You should never fly the drone in these areas. Geo zone are the temporary zones. They keep getting updated in the website. These are areas where there are construction or other such activities happening. The airspace map is dynamic in nature. You need to check the sound restrictions before each drone flight. Drones used for the survey should have DGCA guidelines and should possess mandatory safety features as notified by DGCA from time to time. The drone should have a minimum 20 megapixel or higher resolution RGB camera with the Capability to capture high quality undistorted pictures. Camera should have the resolution to capture the images less than 5 cm ground sample distance or 5 cm per pixel. The resolution of digital elevation model should be 15 cm per pixel. It is advised to fly the drone in better conditions when the sky is clear and the sun is overhead to minimize the shadows in photographs. Do not fly the drone when it is rainy or windy. The path plan should be such that there is enough overlap between the photos. The front overlap should be minimum 80% and side overlap should be minimum 70%. The flight altitude 
should be as per DGCA prescribed limits. The camera angle should be kept at 90 degree vertically downwards. The survey should cover the entire mining lease area capturing all mining allied activities and 100 meter beyond periphery of the mine to monitor the environmental impact and ascertaining any excavation therein. Each mine must establish at least 5 GCPs per square kilometer of lease area with a certified DGPS instrument before undertaking the drone survey. If area is less than 1 square kilometer, 4 GCPs are only needed. The points to be noted while placing the GCPs are it must be easily visible and well distributed all over the area. The dimensions of the GCP should be minimum 50 cm by 50 cm and you need to mark the X or the cross with contrast colors so that it is visible in the photos. RMS error should be less than 5 cm. At least 3 GCPs must be placed permanently at undisturbed locations and has to be covered in subsequent surveys. This is done to cross check the error. And finally, boundary pillars shouldn't be considered as permanent GCPs. A coordinate reference system defines how the two dimensional projected map relates to real places on the earth. The CRS needed to be used for different outputs are discussed here. The coordinate reference system of the photo captured should be in latitude longitude with WGS84 data and the unit should be in decimal degrees or degree minute second. A datum is the model of the earth that is used in mapping. These are the photos captured. And here you can see the latitude, longitude values are in the degree minute second. The output generated that is the orthomosite should be in UTM and the unit should be in meters. Here I open an orthomosaic file and here you can see that the coordinate reference system is having EPSG code 32643 and in the UTM coordinate system. While moving the cursor you can see the values changing. These are in meters. The GCPs and the boundary pillar coordinates should be in latitude longitude with WGS84 data and the unit should be in degree minute second. And finally, the precision of the data should be in latitude longitude with WGS84 data and the format should be in degree minute second. And the second should have precision up to six digits. Let me show you what that means. Here you can see the value in degree minute second. And here in the second, you need to keep precision up to six digits. The raw and processed data of each survey must be kept safely with the lessee for a minimum period of five years. The data must be submitted to IBM in case required by the IBM for verification at any stage. The data can be stored in cloud platforms such as Survey and Geo Workspace so that there is no risk of getting the data lost or corrupted. Now, let us take a quick recap. First, we discussed what an SOP is. And finally, we discussed all the guidelines present in the SOP. With this, we come to the end of the video. In the next video, 
I will be mentioning about the data outputs and formats needed to be submitted to IBM. If you are watching this video for the first time, please like and subscribe. And we will be sharing more videos weekly. Click on the bell icon so that you won't miss any of the upcoming videos. Thank you for watching the video.